tons of news today, but let's start with the Black Friday deals, because why would they wait until Friday when you've got a whole week of consumerism you could celebrate? RTX 4070 down to 515 with Alan Wake 2 game bundle thrown in here. This is over at Newegg. Now, game bundles, how much should you value those? Well, it depends on if you're actually interested in the game. I'm actually playing Alan Wake 2 right now. It is a very good game, although I could understand if that style of game is not going to be everyone's, uh, you know, cup of tea. So uh, do think about that. But uh, these 4070s launched at $600. They've always been good graphics cards. The problem is they've been overpriced. But $500 is about where I wanted to see them, so $515 with a good game thrown in. I'm finally very happy actually with this, although sure, lower prices would be even better, you know, uh, a while after launch. But here we are. Uh, anyway, what about from AMD? We're seeing the 7900 XT close to its all-time low price. The lowest I've ever seen is $699.99. Uh, and that was on a prime big deal day a little over a month ago, but that didn't come with a game bundle. Now, this game bundle is Avatar, uh, which isn't out yet, so I cannot vouch for the quality of that one the same way I can for Alan Wake 2. Uh, this takes advantage of a $30 off promo code from Newegg to hit that $709.99 price. And uh, if that's still a bit out of your price range, the 6950 XT from the previous generation is hitting $589.99 on Amazon. And um, yes, the 7900 XT is faster. The 7900 XT has 20 gigabytes of VRAM. This has 16. I think 16 is still totally fine. Um, but And I do think that this one's offering better like performance per dollar than the 7900 XT, although it's fairly close. But if this is still out of your price range, how about the RX 6800? This is a 16 gigabyte graphics card for $369.99, and it doesn't just have a lot of gigabytes, it's still a very powerful graphics card. Uh, it is more powerful than, uh, for example, the 4060 Ti, which is uh, it's up against from a price c competition. This doubles the VRAM. Yes, there's a 16 gigabyte 4060 Ti, but that costs a lot more than this does. Uh, and this is the lowest price I've ever seen on this card. I've seen it hit this before, but only using a coupon code. And yes, I say coupon, not coupon. Deal with it. How about a monitor to run your games on? 1440p IPS, 27 inch, G-Sync compatible, 170 hertz for $189.99. Seems like a good deal, good specs. I haven't used this particular monitor myself to vouch for it. And how about a desk to put it all on? A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Flexispot. A while back, my wife got a new classroom and oh man, look at this disgusting mess of a desk they gave her. And Flexispot helped out by upgrading her to a beautiful new standing desk. The adjustability has paid off. She can stand up while she's using it in the classroom. She can sit down for lunch. She can even bring it down to the usable height of the preschoolers in her classroom. And the only problem has been how jealous the other teachers at her school have been. Well, Flexispot is coming through to upgrade one of her co-teachers to the new Comhar EW8Y standing desk. She selected the 48-inch bamboo white uh, with the neon lights that you can also purchase separately. The kids absolutely love these things. They're so cool. Uh, one of the best things about this desk is that it has a drawer as well as a USB charging station in addition to the excellent steady, stable, adjustable standing height, which again has been so useful in the classroom. And best of all, check out Flexispot's Amazon Black Friday deal with up to 70% off and free orders November 24th and uh, through November 27th. Follow the link in the video description and pinned comment. And the last deal I'll mention is that uh, it's looking like a whole bunch of Intel processors are getting discounts on Amazon as well. Uh, so if you're looking for a CPU upgrade, might wanna take a look at those previous generation Intel CPUs. Now let's get more into the actual hardware news. There are reports that G uh, NVIDIA is ending GeForce RTX 4080 and 4070 Ti GPU production in order to make, uh, you know, get inventory to clear out as the super launch is imminent. This, if it's true, would point to the super lineup being a maybe a replacement rather than just kind of slotting in uh, around the current lineup of cards. There's always a question over whether they're going to sell both and just slot these into, you know, different price points uh, or if these will, uh, you know, replace it. 
Now, um, this doesn't say 4070 stomping production. This says 4070 Ti, and we have three rumored uh, super lineups uh, for both of these cards, as well as these 4070 non-super. Now, again, this is hardly official. This is coming from uh, a WCCF Tech article report uh, quoting Chinese board channels forums. Uh, which uh, apparently is uh, the ones making this claim, the idea being to uh, digest its own inventory and waiting the arrival of subsequent new products, which again would point towards that uh, super uh, stuff coming in quarter one, which is what we are expecting. Now, I've talked a lot about those super cards, so how about we get into what are we expecting from the next generation? What about the RTX 50 series? Well, we're getting some new rumors on these specs. We've got RTX 50 Blackwell GB202 GPU, which you would expect to be some in something like a 5090. Uh, if naming schemes stay the same. Uh, rumors are pointing towards GDR7 VRAM at 384-bit uh, bus. Now, this is coming from Copite 7 Kimmy, who, as the uh, GPU leaks and rumors mills game goes, uh, is at the top of the pack as far as um, being quite prolific and actually ending up getting a lot of things right. Um, so he is saying 384-bit at GD and GDR DDR7. Now, that would put it, um, you know, quite a, quite a step up from what we're seeing from 8102, which gives us like cards like the 4090. So interesting stuff. We're also seeing reports uh, saying RTX 50 series to feature DisplayPort 2.1 uh, to maybe catch up to AMD, who are do have that as an advantage right now for their display output technology on their current generation. Although unclear at this point whether it would be like AMD's DisplayPort 2.1 doesn't go up to the full uh, uh, bandwidth that that um, you know te uh, that port is capable of doing. Although it does go higher uh, than what we get on the older revisions that Nvidia currently supports, um, and it's also reporting that it'll be on TSMC's three nanometer node. Uh, this is again a VideoCards.com article, uh, and also again quoting Copite Seven Kimmy DisplayPort 2.1 question mark. Uh, responds with a check. And then, uh, do you know the process node responds with TSMC3. So again, we'll have to see what comes of all of that, um, but that's the current rumor mill. Now, uh, <laughs> another question might be, how big could it be? Now, when we had the 4090 still in the rumor phase, uh, there were also rumors of a 4090 Ti, something absolutely gigantic. At this point, those do not appear to be actually going to launch. But look at the size of this thing. We're getting photos of what, you know, is at least claiming to be a 4090 Ti. And this is up against a Titan RTX. This, <laughs> it's massive. Anyway, it would have been cool to see what, you know, what you could do with one of these things if it actually uh, did end up launching. It was, it was It's quite interesting what we saw from this cooler. But anyway, we're seeing more of those photos in the news, but l let's go ahead and move on. Uh, speaking of the 4090, it is now removed from NVIDIA's official China website. That doesn't mean you can't buy any 4090s in China right now, but I think this is a lot of what's going on with uh, RTX 4090 pricing right now, where the cheapest models are around $2,000 and you used to be able to buy them in the more like the $1,500 to $1,600 range. Still expensive, but that is a massive price increase. And this has to do with the uh, the issue of being not being able to sell RTX 4090 uh, class GPUs in China uh, due to, um, you know, AI stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, just kind of reporting on those, yeah, are being removed from NVIDIA's website in China. So that does seem like it's all going through. Now in other NVIDIA news, now I know this isn't directly GPU related, but I just, I just have to bring up this story. So a, <laughs> this has to do with NVIDIA's car self-driving technology. And basically what goes on, if, if you read this article, is uh, a NVIDIA employee uh, that had left a rival company was in a <laughs> was in a video conference call uh, that included him now working for NVIDIA 
the old company, uh, Vallejo, I believe is how we would pronounce it, that he left, and uh, you know, a, a car company that they were all all working with. So he's in a video conference call that does include people from the company he left, and in a screen sharing mishap, he accidentally, when minimizing his PowerPoint, showed off Vallejo docs, meaning that show, uh, showing that he had taken the source code and a bunch of uh, proprietary documents from his previous employer and then showed those files on a video conference call uh, with the former company that he worked for. I just, I saw this, I know it's not GPU news, uh, I just couldn't, uh, wow, what a series of uh, interesting misadventures, um, <laughs> if we want to put it that way. Also seeing reports that SK Hynix and NVIDIA reportedly working on a radical GPU redesign that 3D stacks HBM memory directly on top of the processing cores. Now that sounds uh, very interesting. This would be a way of doing it with no interposer required, uh, which would certainly simplify things. Although I think right now cooling that is gonna be a major issue. So seeing this anytime soon, and I think this might be more in the like, you know, AI GPU space, looking at HBM4, that kind of a thing. Uh, but interesting design and uh, rounding up my NVIDIA news, um, Oh, I guess this is something I already kind of mentioned. The RTX 4090 prices have gone crazy with the cheapest models now around the $2,000 price mark. Anyway, let's move on to some AMD news. We're seeing some AMD rumors that there will be an 8-core Ryzen 5700X3D and 6-core Ryzen 5 5500X3D. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, AMD's X3D CPUs have proven to be um, absolute gaming monsters. Now this is going back to the previous generation uh, product, which would be on the AM4 boards. A lot of people have AM4 boards. And currently, you know, the 5800X3D is your best upgrade path, but it's still expensive enough that you might consider just going with like a Ryzen 5 7600 and going to a new AM5 platform. But if we, uh, there's also been a 5600X3D, six core chip, but that's been extremely limited supply and limited to only micro center. Now, not everybody, even if you're in the United States, uh, not everybody even lives near a micro center. So this would be interesting if we saw some more X3D chips in the 5000 series as upgrade path opportunities for people still on the AM4 platform. Now, the information from this is coming from Chilled Dog. I, uh, when I used to read this, I thought it was Chili Dog, but now <laughs> I realize that's probably just Chilled Dog uh, or at Golden Mango. Anyway, uh, now Chilled Dog actually has a good track record of motherboard and CPU related leaks. My guess would be that this must be somebody in a, probably maybe in like a motherboard uh, chain of, you know, either at the company or in their, you know, related to their factories where production happens. I don't know, but certainly uh, it, it seems to get uh, news for CPU and motherboard stuff ahead of time and has often been accurate. So uh, this could be happening, but still is for sure a rumor. Now the make or break on this would be price because um, again, the 5800X3D is obviously going to be better. And if you look at these specs that we're seeing summarized here at videocards.com, the 5700X3D would be an eight core part like the 5800X3D, but it is uh, has a 400 megahertz uh, cut to its boost and base clocks, um, which is uh, definitely going to be noticeable in CPU limited gaming performance. So, you know, interesting. And again, the 5500X3D versus the 5600X3D also getting a 400 megahertz cut to boost clock and 300 megahertz to the base clock. So I'm wondering, are these just parts that uh, didn't quite hit the bins to sell as a 5800X3D and a 5600X3D respectively? And if that's the case, what is the quantity going to be? And is this gonna be another like micro center exclusive or is this gonna be a more wide availability? There's just a lot of question marks on this, but with how many people are on an AM4 motherboard, these certainly could be extremely interesting depending on pricing, availability, and performance. 
Again, if they end up even happening, like I said, uh, despite being a fairly reliable leaker, this is still leaks and rumors. Anyway, in other AMD processor news, we're seeing the Ryzen 9 8940HS Hawk Point APU uh, leaking out with eight cores, 5.2 gigahertz clocks, up to 12% faster than the 7940HS. So this would basically be a refresh, not a totally new, like, um, uh, new design of the 7940HS. So it's looking like it could be uh, basically a similar th thing, same sorts of overall specs with a bit of a clock speed bump, uh, offering some better performance. The overall uh, leak here appears to be um, uh, like a, uh, what is this, Geekbench, yeah. Uh, so it's not definitely not a full review, not a full like gaming review and all of that. Uh, but it is showing some better performance. Now, also uh, not uh, sh uh, leaked yet would be if the uh, integrated graphics have any kind of bump there uh, performance-wise. It should be the same, you know, RDNA 3 12 compute unit ty type of setup. Curious if it gets any kind of a clock speed bump or anything. I don't know. Anyway, we're seeing Samsung landing orders for AMD's four nanometer CPUs as chipmaker reportedly seeks to diversify production. AMD's Prometheus to be made by both TSMC and Samsung. So again, this is still, I would put it in the uh, rumors kind of phase. We don't have a lot of concrete details here, but there is some evidence that AMD could be working with, uh, with Samsung's four nanometer process on something to do with their upcoming Prometheus chip. However, um, you know, there is also some in, in information saying they're going with TSMC, which is more normal in what they do. So what I'm wondering is if it's actually gonna be something like the IO die, uh, maybe being made by Samsung and then the actual chip still a TSMC chip and then they just have to get someone uh, to, to package that all together. Anyway, we'll have to see uh, what comes of that. I'm not gonna dwell on it. Uh, AMD Radeon RX 7900M RDNA 3 beats the R NVIDIA RTX 4090 laptop GPU in a Vulkan benchmark. So a while back we saw the uh, AMD finally release a high-end mobile chip with their 7900M and uh, then we haven't really seen a lot of benchmarks or reviews or anything coming out of that. So this is uh, not really the greatest benchmark to go off of. This is again a Geekbench score, but the Vulcan score within it is showing a lead for the uh, 7900 XTX laptop GPU. Um, uh, sorry, this is the, why are we on desktop chips here? Uh, here we go. Uh, the laptop 7900M coming in here uh, beating the 4090 laptop in this particular test. Now this is not gaming benchmarks, and if you look at something like Geekbench's uh, OpenCL benchmark, uh, the uh, the 7900 uh, was uh, getting crushed here again if I scrolled over and found the uh, 7900M laptop. So the laptop again getting beaten uh, in, in this score versus the uh, the comp competitor. But anyway, the point is, this is just Geekbench. This is synthetic stuff. This is an actual gaming performance. So I'm kind of interested in what we get from actual gaming reviews of that chip once they are available. Now let's move on to some Intel news. So we've seen Intel's APO finally getting benchmarked by some big major channels. We're seeing Gamers Nexus take a look at it. Now what is APO? So this is Intel's 14th generation CPU exclusive and only on their highest end chips within that lineup. Uh, basically a some kind of thread optimization, but it needs specific game support. It needs specific motherboard support. It's very difficult to install and get up and running. Um, all sorts of reasons why this is a big hassle and wasn't included as a major part of uh, most uh, day one reviews of the 14th gen CPUs. However, it is looking like it does deliver significant performance gains uh, with APO versus without APO in the two games it's currently supported in. Now, um, what a lot of people wondered when this was first announced is, is it just disabling eCores? But uh, Hardware Unboxed actually tested that and it does seem to be doing more than just disabling the eCores because we've seen in a lot of games if you disable the e-cores or sometimes disabling hyper-threading and things like that, you can get a performance bump if the game doesn't play nicely with those. 
So uh, this is hardware unboxed, te testing uh, Intel APO off, APO on. Uh, this is uh, seeing a major performance jump, but then also testing what if we just turned, uh, didn't use APO, but we turned E cores off and hyper threading off or just E cores off. And it, it certainly is seeming to get a better performance boost using APO. So this does go beyond uh, the what some people suspected, which was maybe it's just intelligently turning off E cores in games that don't like them. So this certainly does seem to be better than that. But the current issues of uh, getting it up and running and game support and, and CPU support makes it a lot less interesting. And again, uh, Intel didn't seem that interested in adding this to more CPUs and was a little unclear on when or if we'd be getting more games. So anyway, uh, in other Intel news, we're seeing Intel's ARC A770 GPU getting an advertised 2.7 times performance boost for stable diffusion with the latest Olive optimized drivers. Uh, now, uh, that's certainly interesting because the A770 is, uh, I think, the cheapest 16 gigabyte graphics card that I'm aware of. So with that in mind, in AI applications, where sometimes you need a large VRAM buffer, it certainly makes it interesting, but only if it, it performs well enough to be worth using. So getting um, some optimizations in Stable Diffusion's Olive Branch certainly sound interesting. Now this is Intel's own claims and I have not verified them myself. I'm just reporting on the claim. So there you go. In other Intel news, we're seeing Intel's unreleased at, up to this point yet, uh, i3-14100 uh, getting CPU, uh, CPUs already on sale in China for $118 despite the CPU not even being available yet. But there you go. So it does look like Intel will eventually release a 14100. And if you're in China, maybe you could buy one already. Now let's move on to some Steam Deck OLED news. Um, one thing is we've seen some testing from Digital Foundry taking a look at um, the less obvious benefits of the OLED screen, which is the input latency advantages. So using an NVIDIA LDAT sensor where you strap a light sensor to the screen uh, and then it's hooked up to a, a special mouse, which is then also hooked into a separate PC, you click the mouse and then um, you record something like a muzzle flash that has a bright flash on the screen. The sensor uh, senses when the flash happens. So you're then measuring the latency in between clicking the mouse and a flash showing up on screen. Uh, then tested the Steam Deck versus the Steam Deck OLED at a variety of frame rates um, to then measure the, uh, the um, input lag advantage on the OLED screen. And some of that could be coming from running in a 90 hertz container, but it can also uh, provide benefits just from the OLED technology and whatever other changes may have happened uh, within the device, because it's showing even locking them both to you know 45 FPS, and, uh, uh, you know 21 millisecond uh, bump uh, between models. Now part of that could be that the Steam Deck OLED can run that in a 90 hertz container at 40 FPS uh, frame rate lock, which is something that you would do on a lot of Steam Deck games, 22 millisecond advantage for the OLED model, at uh, 30 FPS frame rate, where you would be in a 60 hertz container on the old model and a 90 hertz container on the uh, OLED model, like seeing an 18.1 millisecond upgrade, and even at 25 FPS, where this is interesting because both would be within a 50 Hertz container, still seeing a 10.7 millisecond advantage. So that one, they're both running a 50, milli, uh, 50 uh, Hertz container. So interesting stuff in that testing. Although also uh, he tested uh, the uh, Steam Deck non OLED version on its latest firmware versus its older firmware, and actually saw that there was some input lag advantages, pretty major ones, just on the latest firmware update, uh, which that latest update did bring a lot of um, good stuff for the, uh, even for the non-OLED uh, owners, including some uh, brightness and, and color changes to the screen to make it look a little bit better. So interesting stuff going on there. In other handheld news though, uh, we have the PlayStation Portal actually selling out. And resellers, which seems like a kind way of uh, putting um, scummy scalpers, uh, swooping in. <laughs> 
And anyway, the PlayStation 5 handheld streaming device should be costing around $200, but we did actually see it sell out. Now, this is despite a lot of people anticipating that this was a uh, would not sell out due to the fact that it has so many limitations. It basically is just for home streaming off your PS5 if you already own one. And it, sure, it gives you a nice controller for doing that, but you could already do remote streaming, you know, on maybe your phone and hook on some controllers to that, that type of a thing. This also has issues with not supporting general Bluetooth headsets. You have to have for wireless headset, you know, the Sony branded one. Like there's a lot of issues with this device, but it did manage to sell out. And honestly, what I think a lot of people are missing is the fact that like, uh, I can I can say this is like a busy dad and like my TV might be in use for like watching uh, a kid's TV show and I might wanna sit there and hang out, but maybe I'm not that into that TV show. Might be cool to play on some kind of other device. And at $200, this still does cost less. Uh, than something like a Steam Deck. So I'm not trying to defend this device. It has a lot of issues. Um, but, you know, I think it does have a very small niche, but I think it really needs to be dramatically improved. I think uh, one of the major improvements that it should have is supporting actual cloud streaming, not just PlayStation 5 remote streaming. I think that would make it a lot more interesting. Now, I was curious if this would actually happen, and I did see some indication that that may happen in the future. There's no technical limitations, and this was uh, um, in a quote uh, uh, coming from, uh, I think, an interview with someone uh, from Sony talking about it. So anyway, it seems like it's something that they could work on adding in the future. To me, it just seems baffling that they wouldn't launch with that. Like. It, 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 if it's gonna be a streaming only device, you should at least also support cloud streaming out of the box and, and like maybe get people to sign up for your PlayStation uh, you know, uh, Plus uh, streaming service or something like that. It just seems like a weirdly missed opportunity there. And again, th this is up against devices that can actually play games uh, with l like the Steam Deck, for example, where we uh, do see it actually still in stock, the OLED version, um, that one didn't seem to sell out. I was a little nervous at first because it seemed like Steam crashed when I tried to buy one the second they launched, but then it did eventually seem to release in waves. And they're still uh, showing a buy now with an estimated delivery date in, in three to five business days, and mine is shipping, so cool stuff. And that's also brought down the price on the LCD models. And again, if you wanna buy something like this, it does cost more than a PlayStation Portal, but you could then do a lot more than uh, just stream from your PS5. <laughs> so anyway, um, in other handheld gaming PC news, we see the Aya Neo Slide handheld with a Ryzen 7 7840U APU released with a sliding six inch 1080p IPS screen and a physical QWERTY keyboard. So. If what you thought you were lacking on things like the Steam Deck was a slide out physical keyboard, this could be the device for you, although the price is certainly high and it's not an OLED screen. Although again, the 7840U does give you, um, you know, these newer Windows handhelds do have more power. If you wanna see the specs uh, up against a lot of competitors here, realize the text might be small here, but you know, things like the Lenovo Legion Go, uh, Asus ROG Ally, and now Aoneo Slide. Uh, uh, you know, they all have that 7840U, which can offer more performance than the Steam Deck, although at low power consumption, uh, the Steam Deck can often compete pretty well. And now we get that OLED screen. So it's certainly an interesting space and I like to see it expanding. Um, but speaking of streaming a little bit earlier, uh, and you know, streaming to these types of devices can be another interesting application for them. We do see GeForce now introducing PC Game Pass support uh, with Xbox account syncing and a new membership bundle revealed offering a few months of Game Pass with the subscription. So that's certainly, I think, uh, a, a strong um, combo there. And it does seem like GeForce Now is providing the best technology behind their streaming service 
uh, from a performance and latency standpoint. Uh, but uh, Amazon's still in the game with their Luna Cloud Gaming, uh, which is now expanding to Italy, France, and Spain. If you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can try out Amazon's Luna uh, in a few games. Uh, although I think to get access to more games, you'd have to pay, uh, pay an additional fee. Uh, we're seeing Handbrake uh, adding AV1 support for NVIDIA RTX 40 and AMD RX 7000 RD93 GPUs. This is a popular, you know, video uh, uh, conversion uh, uh, app. Anyway, uh, we see Sam Altman no longer CEO of OpenAI and getting fired as board no longer has confidence in his abilities. Looks like he might be popping over to Microsoft. Anyway, um, you know, or maybe our, uh, our, in the future, we've had people come uh, back from the future and, and try to disrupt this company before Skynet takes over. Well, I, you know, there's a lot of things that could be happening. Uh, we're seeing Baldur's Gate 3 getting a deluxe physical edition as opposed to the uh, digital only that we've been at uh, previously. That should be coming in quarter one, 2024, and it should be playable offline via disc on consoles. PC does appear to be getting a physical deluxe edition, but I do think you're just kind of getting a game code uh, into the packaging because, you know, PC games on disc, really? That's just not a thing anymore. <laughs> now, uh, we are seeing some people testing the newer version of Ray Reconstruction that came from Alan Wake, dropping that DLL into Cyberpunk, and seeing some improvements to the ghosting issues. Cyberpunk's ray reconstruction did a lot for the image quality and for the performance in the path tracing mode, but it did introduce a lot of ghosting. So I haven't tested this myself, but apparently um, people are trying this out and reporting good results. And then I'll also mention we, that we have PC system requirements for Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Um, and so a lot of info coming out on this. Uh, the latest reveal on it, you know, seemed a little more promising than what we initially saw. A lot of pushback against this being a live service game. Um, but anyway, it did show some actual like story content that seemed maybe a little bit more promising. But anyway, we did get system requirements. Minimum are a GTX 1070 or an RX Vega 56 and CPUs being an i5 8400 or Ryzen 5 1600. Now they're not giving us any kind of uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM. They're not giving us any kind of performance targets on that. Uh, so I don't know exactly what to make of this, so I'm not doing a separate video, just throwing it out here at the end. Uh, for the recommended specs, we're seeing an RTX 2080 or a 6800 XT. That seems to be a weird combo in my opinion, just because they're usually different in performance, uh, unless there's ray tracing involved in the recommended settings, but again, it's not giving us a lot of details. We're also seeing a 10700K CPU up against a 5800X 3D, and I would normally expect the 5800X 3D to be stronger there. So I don't know exactly what to make of these system requirements, but I thought I'd throw them in here. This game should be coming out in uh, February uh, 2nd, 2024. Hope you guys found the video useful and interesting. And again, check out the link in the video description uh, and pinned comment to check out those awesome desks from Flexispot.